Assalamu alaikum students. Welcome to lecture 3 at Virtual University, the introduction of cultural anthropology. Today is an important lecture. In this lecture, we will talk about the idea of the various important theories that inform cultural anthropology. Now, cultural anthropology, as uh, we have introduced over the past two lectures, is a very diverse and a simultaneously basic yet complicated subject since it tries to look at the human condition and try to understand human behavior. Now, in order to do this, culture cultural anthropology has some fundamental basic theories which guide cultural anthropology and today we are going to be looking at some of these major theories. So like I said, we are going to move on today by trying to look at these underpinning theories which inform the discipline of cultural anthropology. Now. In order to do this, I will first focus your attention on the idea of a theory. And I will do so by asking a basic question, what is a theory? A theory suggests a relationship between existing phenomena. Now, in saying this, in making this claim that a theory tries to establish a relationship between existing phenomena, what one is trying to say is that there is a huge diversity of circumstances, of, of, of conditions that are found, evidently found on earth. I mean, human existence has various forms. There are various forms of problems. There are various forms of ingenuity, of, of diversity, of versatility to be found within the human being. Now, a, what a theory tries to do is it tries to make an informed opinion regarding this phenomenon. Ab jo insaan, jo cultural theory mein misal ke taur pe, ab jo insaan, insaanon ke rehne ke andaz hain, bolne ke andaz hain, baatein karne ke andaz hain, unko theory ke zariye explain kiya jata hai. So theory jo hai, wo attempt hai, ke existing phenomenon ko explain kare. In order to do this, what theories do is they allow us to reduce the complexity of reality into an abstract set of principles which serve as models to compare and contrast different types of reality. Now, this doesn't have to only apply to the idea of cultural anthropology. This definition of a theory holds true for any discipline. In any discipline, the complexity hai of, of circumstances that can be explained with reference to basically a theory which tries to look at the gist, which is focus on the theory. So a theory will try to explain the fundamental aspects of a problem and try to deal with them. It will try to compare and contrast different types of realities. Jab ek theory hai wo fundamentally pick up kar deti hai ya highlight kar leti hai un particular issues ko jo ke fundamental points hote hai ek problem ke baare mein let's say to wo phir theory ye kar sakti hai ke wo kyunke ek abstract idea hai a theory is, now if I'm looking at the issue of poverty, they, I can develop a theory about poverty, that poverty jo hai, wo is, is, is wajah se poverty exist karti hai. Now I can, by virtue of a theory, mujhe ye fayda hoega ke mein us theory ko apply kar sakunga mukhtalif circumstances mein. I don't have to necessarily confine myself to the definition of poverty ke jiski jayb mein das rupay se kam hai, wo gharib hai. Jo din mein das rupay se सकता हूं कि जिसके पास परचेसिंग पावर नहीं है वो गरीब है 
تو وہ پھر چاہے اگر وہ جاپان میں رہتا ہے اور اس کی جیب میں اگر دو ین ہیں تو وہ بھی غریب ہو سکتا ہے کیونکہ میں اکویٹ نہیں کر رہا پاورٹی کو ود دا اماؤنٹ آف روپیز ان دا پاکٹ آئی ایم ٹاکنگ اباؤٹ پرچیسنگ پار اینڈ پرچیسنگ پار جو ہے وہ پیسے سے آ رہی ہے اینڈ ایف آئی ایم ٹرائنگ ٹو ڈیفائن پاورٹی بائی ورچو آف پرچیسنگ پار آئی ہیو ڈیولپڈ اے تھیری آئی ہیو ڈیولپڈ اے تھیری دیٹ جس کے پاس پرچیسنگ پار نہیں ہے دیٹ پرسن از کنسڈرڈ پور اینڈ بائی ورچو آف دس تھیری آئی کین لک ایٹ پاورٹی دا فنامنا آف پاورٹی ان پاکستان آئی کین لک ایٹ دا فنامنا آف پاورٹی ان جاپان سو اے تھیری گیوز یو دا ایڈوانٹیج آف ٹیکنگ اے پرابلم آف لکنگ ایٹ اٹس فنڈامنٹل ایشوز آف آف اپلائنگ یور تھیری ٹو ٹو ایکسٹریکٹ دوز وائٹل ایشوز اینڈ کمپیئر دوز ایشوز ود این ادر سیٹ آف ایشوز ود این ادر ریالٹی and that is the advantage of developing a theory theories are generally based on hypotheses and based on hypotheses they provide a proposition that needs to be tested through empirical investigation ab iska kehne ka maqsad ye hai this is again a generalized statement regarding theories which can be applied to any subject to the study to the scientific investigation of any academic principle be it cultural anthropology be it sociology be it economics be it the natural sciences uh, like chemistry or biology basically a theory in order to develop a theory you need a hypothesis hypothesis kya hai hypothesis hai ke wo ek presupposition leta hai wo kehta hai ki ji hypothesis mein ye claim kiya jata hai ke agar to meri theory sahi hui to اگر سرکمسٹانسز کو میں نے دیکھا اور ایویڈنس کو دیکھا تو اگر وہ ایویڈنس جو ہے اگر وہ فٹ ان کر جائے گی میرے ہائپوتھسس کے ساتھ تو دیٹ مینس کہ مائی ہائپوتھسس از کریکٹ دیٹ مینس دیٹ مائی تھیری ہیز بن ری انفورس سو اب اس کو کرنے کے لیے اس پروپوزیشن کو پروف کرنے کے لیے اپنے ہائپوتھسس کی پروپوزیشن کو پروف کرنے کے لیے آپ کو سہارا چاہیے گراؤنڈ ریالٹی کا آپ کو سہارا چاہیے ایویڈنس کا اب میں تھیری ایک بنا لوں اپنی کہ جی سارے پاکستانی بڑے اچھے ہیں دیٹ از اے تھیری مائی ہائپوتھسس مائی ہائپوتھسس وڈ بی دیٹ آل پاکستانیز آ گریٹ پیپل ناؤ ان آرڈر ٹو پروو مائی تھیری آئی نیڈ سم ایویڈنس کوئی مجھے مثال تو میرے پاس ہونی چاہیے نا ٹو بیک مائی کلیم کہ جی سارے پاکستانی بڑے اچھے ہیں سو ان آرڈر ٹو پروو اینی تھیری یو بیسکلی نیڈ ٹو شو ایویڈنس یو نیڈ ٹو شو فرام گراؤنڈ ریالٹیز یو نیڈ ٹو پرووائڈ ایویڈنس ٹو بیک یور کلیم ٹو بیک یور ہائپوتھسس ٹو بیک یور پرپوزیشن دیٹ از اے فنڈامنٹل ریکوائرمنٹ آف اے تھیری ناؤ having uh, laid down these basic principles of what a theory is i will move on and look at a particular theory that is very important in the idea of anthropology in the idea of studying cultural anthropology and this theory is called cultural evolution now you some of you might be familiar with the idea of evolution and the idea of evolution was developed by darwin and darwin proposed that every living species over time has evolved we were not born we were not created the way we are but rather over time we have developed as human beings and this is a very important scientific theory and there are various aspects of this theory i mean there is biological i mean you can look at the idea of evolution at at a biological level you can look at the idea of evolution at a physical level you can apply the idea of evolution to politics to the development of political systems to the development of uh, political theories to the development of of culture to the development of cultural sophistication so they have been uh, academics within 
the branch of cultural anthropology who latched on to the idea of evolution and developed the notion of cultural evolution. And this is a very important theory in cultural anthropology and I will now highlight some of its main features for you. All cultures undergo the same development stages in the same order, savagery, barbarism and civilization. Now, before I explain this particular point, I will quickly add that it is important to keep in mind that these theories themselves evolve. I mean, today we might be looking at this theory and consider it to be a bit absurd, but we have to keep in mind that this theory was uh, the theory of cultural evolution was developed more than a hundred years ago. It was developed at a time where cultural differences were justified on the basis of supernatural causes. I mean, people were thought, it was thought that black people have something in their genes that makes them, you know, better, more receptive to music. It was thought that gypsies have something in their blood that, you know, makes them, that makes them want to travel all the time and not settle down. It was thought that there are particular issues that people, there's, people have bad blood because of which they commit crime. So there were all these sort of, sort of unexplainable reasons attributed to human behavior. And cultural evolution, although some of its ideas may seem basic now, broke away from that. It tried to provide some kind of a scientific basis to look at culture to the idea of cultural difference. And its first stage was considered to be, at a very basic level, to be that of uh, savagery. And savagery was further classified as, as lower, middle, and upper savagery. Now, these cultural evolutionists thought that all societies, all cultures, all people have gone through these basic stages. And the first stage was that of lower savagery. That was the first stage of their evolution. In this stage of lower savagery, people were basically hunters. Uh, sorry, they were basically gatherers. I mean, they didn't know how to hunt. All they could do was pick up fruits or pick up uh, nuts and berries and eat them. They didn't even have the capacity to hunt. Subsequently, at a middle stage of savagery, people, as they evolved over time, were able to make fire. That was the, the better end of savagery. And at the higher stage of savagery, people were actually able to hunt. So this is, uh, this is one classification that supposedly all people went through according to the, cult, uh, to the cultural evolutionists. Then came this other stage of barbarism. In barbarism, the first benchmark, there were again three sub-branches in barbarism. The most basic level of barbarism was the uh, use of pottery. When people were able to uh, use clay and, and put it into the shape of vessels and all, that was the first stage of barbarism. The second stage of barbarism, according to these uh, people, was the development of irrigation, when people actually started farming. And at the third stage, they started using metals. That was the, the upper end of barbarism. So from this upper end of barbarism, you know, came the notion of civilization and of civilizations evolving and going from the stage of basic civilization to the stage of very advanced civilization. But what's important to remember here is that cult cultural anthropologists that followed this train of thought basically felt that uh, all, cultural, uh, all cultures go through the same type of evolution, to, through the same process of evolution. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that evolution is unidirectional according to this theory and leads to higher levels of culture. So these theorists felt that not only do all
people undergo the same processes of savagery, barbarism, and then civilization. But this is a kind of a development that is unidirectional. I mean, it is that all cultures have to go through these stages to reach the idea of civilization. And they have to go through certain processes within civilization in order to qualify for other processes. So they th felt that basically certain civilizations in the West were at the upper end of civilization. Now, cultural evolution has a bit of a deductive approach. Cultural evolution tries to, one has to admit that cultural evolution was an interesting idea that took on the idea of science developed by Darwin. But at the same time, there were certain problems with the idea of, of cultural evolution that I will just mention. But before doing so, the important thing to remember is that cultural evolution used a deductive approach. Now, what is a deductive approach? A deductive approach takes circumstances and it doesn't use the circumstances to make a theory. It takes a theory and explains those various circumstances. So it has a general principle and based on that general principle, it will look at various circumstances and try to seek justifications for those circumstances based on a general theory. It's like me saying poverty means having less than 100 rupees and then I go out you know, on the streets of Lahore and try to find all those people who have less than 100 rupees. So that is taking a general principle and using a deductive approach. Instead of going around and seeing how much money people have and then looking at people who cannot even eat and then seeing what amount of money they have and then saying the people who have that amount of money, that little amount of money must be poor. I turn it around the other way. So this is what deduction means. And cultural evolution uses a deductive approach to apply a general theory to specific cases that this is the kind of approach that cultural evolution used. Evolutionists were often ethnocentric as they put their own societies on top of the evolutionary ladder. Like I said before, evolutionists, there was a great tendency for evolutionists to think that since they themselves, these ev cultural evolutionists, belonged to Europe and to America, they had already reached the level of industrialization and they felt that their societies were at the top end of civilization and all these other poor developing countries had to go through the same processes in order to qualify for being civilized, for being highly civilized. And this was an ethnocentric approach which if you recall means assuming that your own culture is superior to everyone else's culture. Now, the important thing to remember about cultural evolution, I mean, although these, some of these other ideas might seem a bit strange, the thing to remember about cultural evolution is that human behavior was explained by rational instead of supernatural causes. This, again, is, is trying to show you that the advantage of having a theory is that theories are informed by circumstance and theories can explain a lot of circumstances and evolve themselves. Theories themselves evolve. And at the time, if you look at the, develop the development of this particular theory, you will realize that cultural evolution, at given the kind of thinking that was, going, that was pervasive and going around in those days, it was actually a, a positive step because it, it tried to basically provide a rational explanation for cultural difference. Instead of saying that, oh, you know, some people are cursed to be, you know, to be walking around without clothes and, you know, uh, with spears in their hands, it tried to provide some kind of a rationale. I mean, that rationale might not stand to reason, you know, from, from our perspective, 
from the perspective of a 21st century student or academic, but at the time these kinds of you know uh, theories and this theory was was considered to be an evolution in itself. Now I will turn to another theory and another theory within cultural anthropology is that of diffusion. Now diffusion claimed that all societies change as a result of cultural borrowing from one another. Diffusion basically considered humans to be fairly in, in, in inventive. I mean it thought that you, human, it didn't really emphasize the idea of invention. It thought that one thing that is invented in a particular society tends to keep going around and diffuses. I mean let's say the, the Chinese developed the notion of a wheel and that notion traveled everywhere around the world. So in, in this you know in this theory the idea of one idea traveling from one culture to another was was realized and this was an important realization you know the realization that ideas can actually travel from one place to another and because of this uh, diffusion is considered important in in these in in these times and it's important to look at the theory of div, uh, diffusion although some of the things proposed by diffusion were a bit absurd before mentioning that some of the absurdity tied to diffusion i will have to point out an, another important thing and that's the idea that like evolution uh, evolutionism diffusionism was deductive as well and it was a bit too theoretical it did not look at circumstances jo zameen pe halat the unko kam dekhta tha diffusionism bhi wo bhi us diffusionist ki bhi tendency thi to be like the armchair theorists ke wahan kursi par baith ke wo feel karte the ke hame ji sab kuch samajh aa gaya unme bhi ek ye tendency thi now diffusionism highlighted the need to consider interaction between cultures but over emphasize the centrally valid idea of diffusion ye jo theory thi usne ek to acha ye kaam kiya ke usne ye idea theoretically across kara diya establish kara diya ke ji ek culture se dusre culture mein ideas jo hain wo transfer hote hain which was you know at the time this was a novel idea you know to realize that cultures interact and influence each other and and to establish that you know in a in terms of a theoretical principle the realization in and the use of this principle by cultural anthropologists to study people was a serious accomplishment but the the diffusionists got a bit carried away with this idea and this brings me to the earlier point that you know diffusionism now seems a bit strange i mean there were some prominent thinkers within diffusionism who thought that essentially all the innovation is with a small amount of tinkering has originated from egyptian civilization so the egyptians were the most inventive the most uh, civilized form of human culture and from that time there have basically uh, been there's been this diffusion of of uh, egyptian civilization to other parts of the world and that's how civilization spread which seems a bit hard to believe in in present circumstances now historicism is another theory that was developed basically in the united states and theory of historicism states that any culture is partially composed of traits diffused from other cultures so it admits you know that there was some substance to the idea of diffusionism but this does not explain the existing complexity of different cultures so from the viewpoint of historicism cultural div- uh, diffusion is not enough cultural diffusion does not explain the complexity of different cultures now the good thing about historicism was that it was an inductive 
approach. It focused on the collection of ethnographic facts and it insisted that before developing any kind of uh, cultural theory, it was important to look at the ground realities. Now, this was a interesting and a very important step forward in terms of in terms of cultural theory. It was a sort of a leap forward, as it were, and it firmly planted the idea of cultural anthropology as a creditable science. You know, it used similar principles to other scientists by, you know, by asserting the fact that essentially you cannot just make a theory out of thin air. Just because you think something sounds good doesn't necessarily mean that that's true. So, in order for cultural anthropologists to be able to prove their hypothesis, they need to find empirical evidence. They need to have evidence of ground realities which proves that w their theory holds some substance. This is an inductive approach. Before, we had spoken about the deductive approach, and the deductive approach does exactly uh, the opposite. I mean, it takes a theory, a good-sounding theory, you know, which might be very sophisticated, but it takes that theory and it tries to apply that to, to ground realities. It says, okay, poverty must mean having less than 100 rupees. And then it goes out trying to find poor people with less than 100 rupees. Or it says that intelligence must mean that you can recite Bange Dara, for example. And it goes around trying to find people who can recite Bange Dara or, you know, couplets from Ghalib. And it doesn't look at existing circumstances and form the idea of intelligence based on existing circumstances. That is what an induction, uh, in, in inductive approach is going to do. An inductive approach will look at circumstances, it will look at different people, it will look at how within those circumstances certain people tend to show signs of intelligence and then say based on those signs De determine the idea of intelligence. It could be that, you know, it's a hundred poor people and two or three of them seem to be doing well despite their poverty. So it will look at the circumstances of those two or three people and then say, in these circumstances, this is ingenuity. This is effort. Despite their circumstances, they are at least trying. So this is the definition of trying. This is the definition of ingenuity. So this is an inductive approach. And historicism did use an inductive approach. Now, historicism relied on direct field work. It emphasized direct field work, which was considered essential, which has provided the approach a solid methodological base, emphasizing the need for empirical evidence. Now, this is just another way of trying to get across the point that the, histori the, uh, the historicism theoretical approach relied on existing circumstances. It told its, it, its disciples, as it were, I mean, they were scholars who identified themselves with this particular branch of cultural anthropology. It, it basically meant that these particular scholars would go out into the field and try to immerse themselves in a particular culture to sort of go and live in a culture to try and find out in a culture what those people thought, how those people behaved, how those people acted, what were their values, what were the reasons behind those behaviors, those values, those ideas. And based on this ground reality, they, would, they could only then try to develop a theory. Now this was the exact opposite of what the diffusionists or what the evolutionists did. And this was the inductive approach, focusing on ground reality, focusing on trying to get evidence. So, essentially, this particular approach within the discipline 
this approach of historicism provided a very solid methodological basis to the theory of cultural anthropology and providing in providing this methodological basis it was also a bit more humble than evolutionist at least i mean it realized that each culture does not go through the exact same processes of cultural development and this was an important realization historicism realized that each culture is to some degree unique it admitted to this fact at least which was theoretical ad advancement to the idea of evolutionism and historicism also emphasized that ethnographers should try to get the views of those being studied not only rely on their own views so essentially it focused on the idea of talking to the native of talking to people who were being studied of getting their views of looking at their concerns their issues talking to them not only focusing on you know the the person the ethnographer who goes there with his briefcase trying to you know to to uh, trying to sort of put words in the mouths of of people that they go and try to study i mean essentially ethnographers were under this theory were guided to be very careful and and you know very precise in drawing the line between what the natives thought and said and what these people themselves thought and the focus was meant to be on the on looking at the ground realities on looking at what the native thought on looking at what the native of a particular uh, environment of a particular locality thought historicism also emphasized the need for training female anthropologists to gain access to information about female behavior in traditional societies i mean this was a an interesting development that took place i mean historicism realized that by virtue of its of its nature of study it would look at it would try to use female anthropologists the reason for trying to use female anthropologists was that there was since there was an emphasis on trying to discover ground realities and a lot of these ground realities took place in societies that were conservative traditional that did not look favorably to the idea of strange uh, men be the researchers or anthropologists you know coming and observing the women of those communities they would uh, they would that would prevent cultural anthropology to find out the circumstances of these women and the only way for them to find out the circumstances and the problems and the way these uh, the the way these uh, women in different types of society societies were living was to train female anthropologists and therefore historicism encouraged a lot of females and a uh, very fe uh, very famous anthrop female anthropologists were trained by this emphasis uh you know due to this emphasis they were able to obtain training and contributed immensely to the field of uh, cultural anthropology and one of them was uh, named uh, margaret mead whose name you will uh, come across in your own readings on cultural anthropology now the problem with touricism was its uh, anti theoretical stance it basically was criticized for retarding growth of the anthropological discipline now historicism in its emphasis to focus on ground reality to focus on what the native local people thought and and felt about their own circumstances it tended to put place a bar on theory it said for, it emphasized that anthropologists working under this discipline should go out and go out into the field and look at the problems talk to the people and gather evidence and gather a lot of evidence before any theories could be made and to a certain degree this prevented the development of anthropological theories and there were critics who blamed historicism for this sort of you know retardation of anthropological theory 
Now I will move on to the idea of uh, psychological anthropology and psychological anthropology working under this discipline focus on the need to explore the relationships between psychological and cultural variables. So anthropologists in this regard, I mean, they try to look at the connection between culture and the psyche, between the human mind, between how particular people think and how those thought processes are influenced by their surrounding cultures. And this is also a very interesting and an important uh, field of research. And I mean, there are various significant uh, influences that our cultures have on us. I mean, and in terms of, you know, uh, being Pakistanis and lo located in a geostrategic environment with a particular history and a particular education system and a particular religion, all these things have a tremendous influence on who we are. Now, for psychological anthropology, the role of personality is very important. And personality, according to these anthropologists, is largely the result of learning culture. So, personality, to a great degree, is considered to be influenced by culture. I mean, this is individual personality. Now, me as a Pakistani, by virtue of you know all these uh, circumstances, imply that I will, my personality will be formed by all these processes, by the historical processes of, of, you know, being a Muslim who came to the Indian subcontinent, you know, all those, all those hundreds of years ago, I mean, that, that is a sociological, political phenomena, that's a part of my culture which influences me. I mean, there is the fact that you know, I, they, the colonial uh, empire of the British was here and it established schools and I went to an English medium school. That formed a part of my personality. So these are influences, cultural influences that inform the way that our personalities are formed. And this, is, this has great value for psychological anthropology. Psychological anthropology considers universal temperaments to be associated with males and females that do not exist in practice. So psychological anthropologists, one important discovery of psychological anthropologists was that, you know, these sort of supposedly universal attributes of what a, what a male is supposed to be and what a female is supposed to be. If you look at various cultures around the world, you see significant blurring. You see a lot of gray area between personality types, you know, like in terms of I mean, to use a stereotypical blanket example, I mean, there's this common notion that females are more sensitive or females are more caring or females can communicate better, whereas men are more aggressive or men have assume a greater sense of responsibility. These are assumptions, you know, made on the basis of gender. And this is an issue that will be explored in much greater detail in later lectures, the idea of, of gender but uh, from an anthropological perspective, but essentially for now, I mean, it, this branch, this theory tried to show that these supposedly universal descriptions do not necessarily hold true when you look at cultures around the globe. You will see in various cultures men acting in ways which are supposed to supposedly uh, feminine qualities. You will have women assume a lot of responsibility. I mean, with the phenomenon of globalization, unemployment, decreasing incomes, even women in our own country have assumed a lot of the responsibility of running a household, which is traditionally supposed to be this manly attribute. So circumstances and personality types are not necessarily gender determined. This was an important discovery. Now, another theory that I'll turn your attention to is that of functionalism. Functionalism, like historicism, focused on understanding culture from the perspective of the native. So, functionalists also said that it's very important to look at what the native, what the local, what the person who we go and try to study thinks. How that person is affected by 
their environment, what they think about their circumstances. I mean, we can go and, and you know, for example, we can, out of our car window, we can look at this, you know, young child who's asking for money and form all these opinions that, oh, he must be trained and, you know, he's probably not wearing slippers because, you know, he wants to impress people and get more money out of them, you know, by walking around barefoot on, on you know, on a, on a hot road in, in the middle of summer. But what is that person thinking? You know, so functionalism also at that time was, was a theory, and this is, again, at the turn of the 20th century, was trying to understand culture from the perspective of the native, from those who were, from the perspective, from the viewpoint of those being studied. Functionalism was very much focused on the idea of empirical fieldwork. It considered empirical fieldwork to be absolutely essential. And again, like historicism, it focused in the idea of empirical fieldwork that it is necessary, absolutely necessary, in order to form a theory to go and do the legwork, to go and, and see what the circumstances are that we are talking about. You know, how can a cultural anthropologist formulate a theory without knowing how people act and behave and what they do? I mean, there needs to be some evidence for formulating a theory. So, groundwork, empirical evidence was considered to be a center. Functionalism also emphasized that anthropologists should seek to understand how different parts of contemporary cultures work for the well-being of the individual and the society, instead of focusing on how these parts evolved. So, functionalism took a functionalist approach towards anthropology, it focused on the function of a particular behavior. Instead of seeing how that behavior evolved over time, it said, let's look at the here and the now. Let's look at why this behavior is the way it is. What purpose does this behavior serve? Functionalism also considered society to be like a biological organism with all of its parts to be interconnected. So it considered culture, it considered society to be interrelated, like the parts of a body, it thought culture, in particular cultural traits, to be related to each other, like the concept of zakat in Islam is related to the idea of, of social equality, to the idea of, you know, giving and sharing and, and uh, you know, uh, generosity, and they are, and it's a, a distributive system, if you will, in terms of economics, it's like, it, it's like a, a very effective taxation system. So, and it fits into this idea of this equal distribution of wealth, at least, you know, more uh, equitable than, than, than it is in many parts of the world, including our own. I mean, if people were to give zakat properly, I mean, there would be a more equitable distribution of wealth. So, zakat is one part of the Islamic culture and it has many implications and it's, you know, part of a particular ideology. And similarly, cultural traits are part of this entire monolithic uh, entity, if you will. And uh, in that regard, um, these ideas are all interconnected. Now, functionalism, emphasizing the high level of integration, felt that societies tend to be in a state of equilibrium. A change in one part of the system brings a change in another part of the system as well. So, by focusing on the idea of the integration between various cultural traits, functionalism felt that if you, if you remove one trait, it's going to affect the rest of culture as well. It's like, you know, if someone tr attempts to take out a lung from my body, it's going to upset my entire biological system. So, one particular cultural trait has, is tied into all these other cultural traits, and you cannot uh, change one cultural trait without affecting the entire culture. It considered these institutional structures of any society to perform in indispensable functions without which the society cannot continue. So functionalism said that like those parts of the body, like those cultural traits, they are institutions within a particular society that perform vital functions. And without those institutions, you would not be able to make that culture function. Like, for example, the, the concept of zakat, 
without the idea of zakat, you could not have the idea of equality in Islam. Zakat is a fundamental and very important and crucial component of the Islamic ideology and culture. Now, another very important theory, and this is a theory that's been built upon the older theory of evolution, is this theory of neo-evolution. And neo-evolution feels that cultures evolve in direct proportion to their capacity to harness energy. So, neo-evolutionists, and there, there uh, is a perceptible, there's a, you can feel the influence of neo-evolutionism in cultural anthropology even today. I mean, c these anthropologists felt that basically evolu evolution does exist, and the basis of evolution is the capacity of a culture to harness energy. I mean, they even proposed a simple equation which says that energy into technology equals culture. So the greater the technology, the greater the energy, the more sophisticated a culture. Neo-evolutionists maintained that culture is shaped by environmental and technological conditions. They said that environment and technological conditions are very important in culture. I mean, these are the two most important attributes from the neo-evolutionary viewpoint. I mean, the amount of technology and the environmental conditions, surrounding environmental conditions of a culture. I'll just uh, read a quote which succinctly, which describes the idea of neo-evolutionism very well, and it's by Leslie White, who was a neo-evolutionist born in, the, in 1900 and died in 1975. And Leslie White says that culture evolves as the amount of energy harnessed per capita per year increases or as the efficiency of the means of putting energy to work increases. Again, this very simply emphasizes the idea of energy and how energy is important for culture. Now, neo-evolutionism feels that people facing similar environmental challenges develop similar technological solutions and parallel social and political institutions. By focusing on the environment, by saying that people in having, facing the same environmental problems will essentially react in the same way. They will develop the same technological responses, develop the same economic and political structures. They give the example in the Middle East of Egypt. They give the example in South America of Peru of relatively dry areas with river systems. And they developed irrigational systems to, for agricultural purposes and developed all these economic and cultural and political systems by virtue of this environmental need. So neo-evolutionism says that Basically, again to recap, in addition to uh, the response of environmental factors, cultures evolve when people are able to increase the amount of energy under their control. Neo-evolutionism, in its emphasis on technology, the environment and the evolution of cultures based on their capacity to harness energy, de-emphasizes the importance of ideas, of beliefs and values, which is, I suppose, critical, this evokes a certain amount of criticism that neo-evolutionism looks at energy, you know, it looks at the idea of energy and how people adapt to the environment on this basis, but it de-emphasizes these notions. Well, this brings me to the conclusion of uh, this lecture. It was a relatively packed lecture, I suppose, since it was trying to look at theories, the important theories of cultural anthropology. I will continue with this, with this type of a lecture in the next lecture as well because there are three or four important theories that still need to be spoken about and thereafter having now introduced uh, the idea of cultural anthropology and the theories in cultural anthropology, we will use these frameworks to look at real life circumstances and that's going to uh, uh, be the remainder of the course. Uh, but for now, I am going to uh, wrap up uh, the lecture and I look forward to seeing you next time.